Guten Tag, meine Freunde. I don't know what uh, he said, but I, I hope it was good. Okay. Um, I assume that uh, most of you here are vegans. And um, what I want to talk about uh, is um, some of uh, the strengths and uh, some of the weaknesses of our movement. And I gave the talk, the title I did, The War We Cannot Lose, because uh, I think we are in a war on this planet right now, a war to save animals, a war to save the planet, a war to save ourselves. And this is a very serious crisis, and that the only two words I can think of that are adequate to describe what's happening on this planet right now are war and holocaust. And so we could not be in a more serious situation than we are. We could not be in a more important point in time than we are now. And we all came to the same place. We're all here together. We come from different journeys. And one way or the other, we overcame the obstacles in our way, the propaganda, the socialization, uh, our families, the media, our peers, all telling us that uh, we must eat meat to be healthy, to be sane, and functioning members of society. My own story, uh, very quickly, is this. I uh, became vegetarian 30 years ago. I became vegan 18 years ago. It happened to me one night while I was uh, half drunk in a fast food restaurant eating a double cheeseburger. And I had a revelation, I can only describe it as a thunderbolt from the cow gods, <laughs> that what I was eating uh, was, was not uh, from a store, but from a slaughterhouse. It uh, was not food, but an animal. It was not meat, but it was flesh. And I had to put it down. And I had an awareness that I, I suddenly had from nowhere, no information, completely intuitive, and I could not get rid of it. I did not want it, but I could not get rid of it. And so after a month of feeling like aliens had abducted me and changed my brain and put me back on Earth, I continued my involvement uh, in left politics. And I was a, a leftist, but a very unusual kind of leftist because I was a left vegetarian. And then I became a vegan and uh, when I read Peter Singer's book uh, around 1985, I uh, saw for the first time in my life how we treat animals. I was a vegetarian and a vegan for health reasons. I had no knowledge of what happens to animals in circuses, zoos, factory farms, slaughterhouses, or vivisection laboratories. And so I realized that it was the animals who needed my activism the most, and in time, I realized that I could help people and help the planet most by helping animals, and the whole picture started to fit together for me. And so I've, I've been around the block. I've been publishing for 30 years. I've been a vegetarian or vegan for 30 years. I've been an activist in every social cause and movement for 30 years. And in that time, I have uh, come to certain conclusions about uh, where we are, in our evolution as human beings, where we are as a society right now, and where we are as a movement, as vegans and animal rights activists. And I've got good news and I've got bad news. The good news is that we are incredibly important to this future as vegans. There will be no future without vegans. The left cannot run a revolution without animal rights activists and without vegans. It is not a revolution to liberate one species on the backs of all other species. Because leftism is just Stalinism towards animals. Leftism is the most radical social paradigm and has the insights that we need to change capitalism, but leftism is in the, is in the Paleolithic era in its understanding of animals. And the leftists and the social progressive movements could not be more backwards in their understanding of animal issues, 
of health and diet, of an ethics of respect, and of the important role that veganism plays for ecology and sustainability. So we cannot have a future without veganism, and uh, we cannot have an ecology, a sustainable planet without veganism. And notice that we are the only movement with a nonviolent ethic. Because leftists believe in killing animals so long as you do it humanely, that is the highest consciousness that they can raise, that they can rise to. Environmentalists believe in hunting and killing and eating animals so long as you do it sustainably and keep the populations intact. But we believe in the value of each and every individual and sentient life and we are completely unique in that. So that's the good news, that uh, we are unique, we are important, we are profound, we are indispensable to a viable future. And now the bad news, which is going to take some time. The bad news is, first and foremost, we do not know how to realize our potential. We, we, re we remain small, weak, and marginalized. We have all kinds of enemies in this world. They include corporations, the corporate media, they certainly include the meat and dairy industries, they include uh, carnivorous ideology, and include the police state and the security forces that enforce uh, the animal holocaust as valid, legitimate, and, and they fully protect it. But in some ways, we are our own worst enemy. In many ways, we are limiting ourselves. We are becoming stronger. We are growing in numbers, but much too slowly, and they are growing much stronger than us at a much quicker pace. There are any number of terms I would use to describe our limitations, and I can't fully unpack each and every one but I'm going to group about uh, seven or eight of them within two different categories. And I'm going to make a generalization. That means I am aware there are exceptions to the rule. I am aware that not everyone in this room fits the kind of vegan I think is weak and problematic. I will create what Max Weber called an ideal type model. So the generalization that I'm going to use uh, is a fair one, and it's an accurate one. We are lifestyle-oriented and apolitical. We are consumerist and easily co-opted into capitalism. We are elitist. We are middle class, upper class, and white. That is because we do not pay attention. We do not care enough about the problems of class and race, and if we did, we would have a stronger, bigger, and more diverse movement. But we don't. We care about our own purity or the purity of other vegans more than we care about social problems and social structures. And a second term of categories I would use to describe our problems before I describe them in more detail. We are isolated. We are isolationist. We live in a small, marginalized community that we accept and we reinforce. And we live in a bubble world, we live in a fantasy land, where we, like most of the population, cannot bear to look at the facts of reality too often. So the first thing I want to say critically about us, with, after those general remarks, is that we overestimate our growth our numbers, and our power. And we do this uh, by manipulating numbers and by looking at very small sectors of reality, by living in our bubble land that we don't see outside of. You can read uh, newspaper headlines that will say, the number of vegan children are growing. There are more and more vegan college students than ever before. But these are small sectors of our population, and the larger population is not growing. And did you know that we have a magical mathematics? It's called fuzzy math. And the vegan outreach people practice this the most. For every pamphlet they hand out, 
Here, here's a pamphlet, vegan pamphlet, vegan pamphlet, vegan pamphlet. They think they get one vegan. One pamphlet, one vegan. 5,000 pamphlets a day, 5,000 new vegans. Now, do we ever look in the garbage can to see how many pamphlets are in the garbage can? Do we ever ask, do they take the pamphlets home and read them? Do we ever ask, do they read them and understand them and begin to experiment with veganism? Do we ask if they tell their friends about veganism, which we use to inflate our numbers? No, we don't. So the vegan outreach people make up their numbers, the most wildly optimistic uh, numbers that they, can, that they can have, so it makes us seem that we are growing. Now, if you think I am exaggerating, there is a group in the United States called Vegan Outreach. They had to admit that they inflated their numbers. The truth is, we have no idea what impact vegan outreach has. We have no idea, there has been no study, but we lie to ourselves and tell, tell us and tell each other that uh, we are doing a great job by handing out vegan pamphlets. Now, a second problem is we use numbers such as the following. We save, if you are vegan, you save 100 animals a year. If you are a vegan, you save five to 6,000 animals in your lifetime. I have a couple of shocking suggestions for you. Because we are so small, because we are so isolated, I suggest that a vegan doesn't save one life a year. Not one. And that is because in countries like the United States, the meat industry is fully subsidized by the government. In the United States, vegans are less than 1%. If there is a tiny drop in the animals killed from vegans, they will give the farmers subsidies by hundreds of millions of dollars. They will give more meat to school children. They will make the prices of meat cheaper. They will make up for whatever they lose. So if you want to save an animal, you go to a shelter. If you want to save an animal, you break into a laboratory. I do not think that vegans save animals because the government and corporations make up for it one way or the other. And we don't know the facts anyway. Now, I have a second shocking fact for you. and includes two words that are taboo in our community, the two words that vegans cannot say, and no, they are not F-U. These two words, my friends, are China and India. We do not talk about China and India because it upsets our little models. These are the world's two most populated nations. China, 1.3 billion people. India, 1.2 billion people. And these countries are rapidly modernizing. They are buying into capitalism. They are exchanging their bicycles for automobiles. There are rice bowls for steak and chicken and ham and turkey. Have you ever heard the, the, the saying that the world cannot afford another United States? Because the United States is about one-fifth of the world's population, but consumes 25% of its resources and energy. Indeed, the world cannot afford another United States. The middle class of China is 300 million people. The total number of people in America is 300 million. So, we have uh, a schizophrenic way, if you allow me to use that metaphor, a schizophrenic way to deal with these realities that we understand consciously, unconsciously, or not at all. On the one hand, we are uh, exuberant. I don't know about you, I am tired of going on Facebook. I am tired of getting emails that say, victory! I recently read on Facebook, 
One vegan said, we will achieve victory in our lifetime. Now the left, the socialists, the Marxists, they like to believe in victory too. But all of them say, we will not see it in our lifetime. But now I see vegans saying, we will win the revolution in our lifetime. I read an article by a vegan a few weeks ago that used fuzzy math to say that we will win in six years. This is a fantasy. This is an inability to deal with reality. This is not helping our movement. It is hurting us. Now, I'm sorry. I don't mean to, to bring you down. I will try to bring you up. <laughs> we have to face some facts. We are not winning. We are losing, and we are losing badly. We are losing to population growth. We are losing to China and India. We are losing to modernization. We are losing to neoliberalism and the eradication of any barrier to so-called free trade. We are losing to authoritarian governments and the loss of civil liberties. We are losing to species extinction and we are losing to climate change. This is what the scientists say, just to give you an example. By the year 2050, we will find the following facts to be true. The world population will be 9 billion people. The oceans will be dead and there will be no fish. We will have lost one-third to two-thirds existing species. All of the polar ice caps will be melted. Where's the victory? Are we winning? Are we going to win? Are we going to win with that attitude that we are winning? There's not a chance. We have got to get out of vegan fantasy land and face the facts of how strong the enemy is and how strong our challenge really is. And so I mentioned that there's a kind of schizophrenia in our mindset. On the one hand, I've, I've shown you we're far too optimistic. On the other hand, we're far too pessimistic. We are passive aggressive. The aggressive part is we will win. Victory, victory now, victory in six years. Here's the passive part. Well, every little bit does some good. Here's the passive part. Well, if I save one person in my lifetime, I've done something good. How pathetically low can we set our standards? You see, the major problem with uh, the way we think about the world can be put in these terms. We pretend like we can leaflet the Holocaust out of existence, we can educate fascists into humanity, and that we have an infinite amount of time to change the world. But the scientists, and I listen to science, I don't listen to vegans, I listen to science, the world consensus, the best facts we have, I study them every day. The scientists say we have finite conditions. We assume an infinite model of change as if we live in the 6th century BC. We live in the 21st century. The scientists say we have a very small window of opportunity. We have a very small window of opportunity to avert catastrophe and what is called the tipping point. After the tipping point, it is too late to stop runaway climate change, runaway species extinction. So we got to get a grip on reality because unless we know the enemy we're fighting, we, we can't fight effectively. We know that veganism is many things. It is a diet minimally. It is also an ethics. And did you know it is a politics? Donald Watson, the founder of veganism, in 1944, defined veganism as an anti-oppression politics. It is against the oppression of, of non-human animals, of human animals, of all oppressions. He defined it in the broadest possible political terms, what I call total liberation. And yet, we have reduced veganism from a politics of total liberation to a lifestyle. And we wonder, why we are small, why we are marginal, why people of color treat us as elitists, and why the left has complete contempt for us. 
because we don't know what vegan outreach means. We don't know what vegan education is. We don't know how to get out of this tiny little pocket that we live in. We are too passive. I often hear the term, veganism is a boycott of evil products. To boycott is to abstain from doing harm. It is not action. It is not active. So, to give um, a shocking uh, analogy, I'm sorry if it offends, but it's the best one I can think of. If I am opposed to pedophilia, and I do not consume child pornography, am I stopping pedophilia? Are we stopping animal slaughter and the animal holocaust by boycotting animal products? If we were 60, 70 percent of the population, maybe, but if we are less than 1 percent of the population and we boycott a product, are our responsibilities exhausted in that? Let me suggest some things that we can do to make our movement more powerful and more relevant. Let me suggest some things that we can do to make the potential that we have to be revolutionary actual. We continue to do vegan education. We continue to do vegan outreach. We get much more creative and much more inclusive. Stop doing vegan outreach at college campuses. Go to families who are poor. Go to the inner cities in the ghettos. Go to people of color. Do get outside of your comfort zone and really do some outreach. Get out of the kitchen and into the streets. Stop baking cupcakes and make recipes for revolution. Am I being too radical now when I say veganism should be a social resistance movement? That we should be out in the streets? and not in our homes, that we ought to stop doing potlucks and start making social things happen, that we ought to start doing what's happening right now, of all places, in the United States, where people have circled Wall Street and almost occupied it for a week. We need to do what they do in England. Put your body in front of the lorry truck. Put your arms around the building of a slaughterhouse. Break down the doors and break down the windows. Stop allowing the Holocaust to continue. Stop being so passive. Let us become a resistance movement. Start breaking the law. Start enjoining in civil disobedience. <laughs> civil disobedience. Stop being good citizens. Fuck the law. When the law is wrong, the right thing to do is break it. <laughs> we need to start breaking some damn laws around here. Now, you think I sound radical? I'm only quoting Gandhi and Dr. Martin Luther King, right? Aren't they our heroes? Don't we admire them? Aren't they the paradigm? of how to bring about change. We quote them all the time in words. We never follow their action. If we were to follow Gandhi and King in action, we would have a social resistance movement. We would be in the streets and not in the kitchens. And there's nothing to be ashamed about when you go to jail for the principled reason. Both Thoreau, Gandhi, King, Tolstoy, Cesar Chavez, all the great people in history taught there is dignity in going to jail when you break the law for the right reason. And for those of you with children, I want to suggest this is a family activity. Because Martin Luther King said, and I quote, we will fill the jails with singing children. Now the environmental movement, we have much to learn from what happened to the environmental movement. The environmental movement has been defeated, co-opted, made part of the capitalist establishment. We can't let that happen to us, but we see it happening. We see it happening with the domestication of veganism, with vegan capitalism, with humane meat. Of course, humane meat is not vegan, but you have animal advocacy groups, the two largest in the world, 
the Humane Society of the United States and PETA, who are certifying humane slaughter and humane meat. PETA buys stock in meat companies so that they can have an influence in their voting. PETA gives awards to Temple Grandin for building slaughterhouse chutes that minimize the fear of animals. We are now working with corporations to make the Holocaust safe so that we can play violins as the Jews march to their death. So I suggest that we escalate the tactics, we learn from the mistakes of the environmental movement, we do not get co-opted, we grow stronger, we fight harder. We resist. We resist illusion. We resist complacency. We resist co-optation. We resist non-resistance. We need to grow in numbers and diversity. The only way to do that is to work with other social movements who already know the streets. I don't know how to do this. I come from the left. I remain in the left. I have tried to talk to the left. It is very difficult. Social progressive movements in general do not respect us. So we need to initiate dialogue. We need to hold out a hand. We need to build bridges with other movements. There is our power, there is our numbers, there is our diversity. And above all, we need to face facts. We need to get out of our vegan bubble. Look at what the banking industry is doing. Look at the IMF. Look at the World Bank. Look at what's happening in the Southern Hemisphere. Pay attention to what corporations our government and governments are doing. Pay attention to science and to ecological facts. We don't want to see science like we don't want to see another animal movie featuring torture. In other words, let's enlarge our vision, understand what's happening in the social world, in the environmental world, and not just in the supermarket, and be strong enough to face the facts and to let them motivate you to fight harder, not give in. You can't change a problem you don't understand. You can't cut out a cancer if you don't know how deep it lies. You cannot defeat an enemy that you underestimate. So, in conclusion, our challenge is to fight without illusions, but never to become disillusioned. I say we take the vegan movement that it currently is, I shall call shallow veganism, and we turn it into something we can call deep veganism, which means that we look at the whole picture, which means that we are not isolated from other movements, which means that we educate, but we also agitate, and which means that we become a force to reckon with. Never something to take granted, never something to buy off with markets, never something to make afraid with police but a true social power, the kind of power that we have latent within us, but have yet to find. So let us start a rethinking of what we are doing. Let us start a critical dialogue amongst ourselves. Let us look at our weaknesses, look at our strengths, and see how we, become, we can become powerful instead of, instead of weak. Let's raise the bar, not lower the bar. Let's jump high and jump over it and clear it. Let's raise our numbers from 1% to 80% and let's transform this society into something sane, humane, and sustainable. And we can't do it alone, but we can do what only we can do. Thank you. Thank you.